uh, my name is Josh Joyner. I'm the product manager of the ArcGIS Geo Event Server. Uh, this session is an introduction to that product. Um, I'm joined today with my colleague, RJ Sunderman, who's a product engineer uh, on our team as well. We're going to be taking a look at kind of a, a general overview of kind of real-time GIS. We're going to take a look at some of the key capabilities of the GeoEvent server. Uh, we're going to look through some of the core kind of fundamentals of working with real-time data, uh, different types of options of how you can bring the data in, the types of processing you can do, and the types of outputs that are available to you. Uh, RJ is going to provide a demo uh, showing us uh, how this works, you know, uh, for real. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about consuming real-time data and then some kind of wrap-up stuff here at the end. So to start with, I'm going to kick it over to RJ, uh, let him kind of talk a little bit about uh, some of the types of observational data. Cool. Thanks, Josh. So when we talk about real-time data, what do we mean when we talk about that? We generally break real-time data into three different categories. We have stuff that just happens there on the right-hand side, like lightning strikes, crimes, tweets. We have things that are moving, say, like airplanes, trains, even animals that are wearing radio collars that we want to track their location. We also have sensor networks that are not necessarily moving, say, like water gauges, air quality sensors. All of this is streaming data, and all of this is data that we can bring into GeoEvent Server in order to do real-time analytics, reporting, and notification. A couple of quick animation slides here. We have vehicles. We have airplanes, boats, cars. These are things with GPS receivers that are moving around. We have the fixed sensor networks that I referred to that are broadcasting over radio networks, broadcasting over cellular networks. We have weather stations that are bringing in temperature, pressure, humidity. Maybe your focus is on public safety and you're looking to track where, ambulance, where ambulances are and where the nearest first responder is to an ongoing incident or an evolving incident. Or in the commercial realm, tracking your commercial vehicles, looking at your electric meter readers, the point is, the first key capability of GeoEvent Server is that we have configurable inputs for almost any type of data, and all of this data can be ingested into GeoEvent. Second key capability is that once we have the data ingested, we want to do some real-time analytics on that data. For example, filtering, I can configure a filter that's only going to allow events with a certain attribute in this animated example, items that are blue or orange to flow through the filter, and then the filter is actively discarding events that are not of interest. Because typically, with real time, you have data coming in at high velocity and high volume, and you want to drill into events that are of particular interest. We can also determine the spatial relationship that an events geometry has with an established geofence. We tend to think of geofences in terms of polygons, and we want to test whether the point is inside the polygon or outside the polygon. But the truth is, geofences don't have to be areas. Geofences can be any geometry, point, line, or polygon, and GeoEvent Server supports all of the spatial relations, all of the spatial relationships of the Java geometry API. So we can do for tests such as disjoint, crosses, intersects. We also want to be able to do on-the-fly processing with the events that come through, not just filtering and determining relationships. We have two dozen processors out of the box that are configurable to do a range of activities. And if you'd like to drill into some of these processors in detail, I'll be presenting a real-time analytics session later this afternoon with Ken Gorton. But just to highlight one processor, the buffer creator does more or less what you would expect. Take an, takes an events geometry and generates a buffer around that geometry so that you can do things like dynamic geofences in order to determine if another feed has a spatial relationship with a feed that you're bringing in, say, for your AVL vehicle location. Once you have the data ingest and you've done some processing, you want to be able to store that data. We have several configurable outputs. One of them allows you to reformat the event data as Esri feature JSON so that you can add and update features in a GeoDatabases feature class. You do this, of course, through a feature service. 
we support the relational database. We also support a spatial temporal big data store, which is a capability of the ArcGIS data store, another component of your ArcGIS enterprise. We do this because, again, real-time data tends to come in at high velocity and high volume. Even if you were receiving data at a fairly low rate of 500 events per second, it would only take you one eight-hour shift to accumulate nearly 15 million event records. So you're going to need a smart way of being able to visualize and look at that data on the screen, and the spatial temporal big data store is a solution for that. Here's a little animation that shows on the fly as I begin to accumulate data in the spatial temporal big data store, it automatically flips over and starts displaying for me an aggregation of that data when I have more than a configurable threshold of events. And you set this threshold to what makes sense for your area of operations, if that is 200 events, if that is 2,000 events. And we can demo this for you down on the island if you'd like to stop down into the showcase later this afternoon. But we're not only storing events in a geodatabase. Just like I have several dozen different inputs that I can configure, I have about a half dozen outputs that I can configure. I don't have to write the data into a geodatabase. I can stream the data and broadcast it over a WebSocket so that anything downstream in my enterprise can subscribe and receive that Esri feature JSON on the fly. The point is, you're in control with GeoEvent Server about how you want to disseminate the data. You don't have to write it to disk. A fifth key capability, then, is notification. Maybe you're interested in tracking this ambulance and you want to know when it leaves its area of operation, and you want to receive an alert. We don't want to be looking at a web, web map all the time, being a slave to a red light turning green or vice versa. We want to receive an email notification or an SMS text, and GeoEvent allows you to take information out of the event record and format it either as a simple text message or use HTML codes to generate more of a rich content email. That then works with your organization's SMTP server to make requests to send out emails. Part of this key capability for this last fifth capability GeoEvent Server is fundamentally RESTful, and by that I mean it accepts REST requests for data. It can also make REST requests on the outbound side. So if you are dealing with an Internet of Things and you have your Azure or your Amazon Cloud and you want to make REST requests out to devices on the edge of the cloud, we can start controlling actuation within our environment. So as events come in, we're sending out broadcast signals and making things happen in our real world. With that, I'd like to hand the presentation over to Josh, who's going to talk a little bit about consuming the data. Thanks, RJ. So RJ mentioned some of the different key capabilities, the first of which was ingestion, so the different types of data that we can bring in to the ArcGIS enterprise system, and we can perform analysis on it through the GeoEvent server. So out of the box, we're able to connect to a number of different, more generic types of data of input. So uh, obviously we can connect to any other existing ArcGIS map or feature service. So if you're using uh, a mobile application like Collector, uh, you have inspections in the field, they're capturing records, that stuff information is writing to a feature service. We can be monitoring that service, and as soon as a new point is created or a feature is updated, we can pull that information into the GeoEvent server, and we can perform analysis on that as well. Also, if you're working with an external data vendor, uh, so maybe you're subscribing to data from an AVL provider uh, for vehicle location information, um, you can pull an external website. Uh, we can also receive data that's being sent to us. Uh, so for an example of something like a Verizon network fleet, uh, that's one of the more popular providers for vehicle fleet management. Uh, you, as a part of the GeoVent server, what you do is expose uh, a REST endpoint that they're able to push data directly to on their schedule. Uh, also, if you're wanting to connect to other devices within your network, um, you can connect over TCP or UDP sockets, um, as well as watch uh, for files on a local folder. So if you have uh, a database that exports a CSV file at a regular interval, 
you could point GeoVent Server to look at that folder location, and as new files are being generated by some other system, we can ingest that data as soon as the file is created. We also have the options to extend the capabilities of GeoVent Server beyond what's available out of the box. So the first way we're able to do that is through our online gallery, uh, which is where we've created um, a multiple uh, a choice of uh, different add-on components that can be added. So I mentioned a few minutes ago uh, some of the work with Verizon. Uh, we also have data feeds um, for things like GeoTab or FlightAware. Um, there's a few, actually about, uh, about 20 different gallery uh, add-ons uh, that are available currently. Um, also, you can connect to some more generic data types. So something, for example, would be an Apache Kafka system um, that you can connect to. We also have a separate set of gallery components. These are ones that were built in conjunction with some of our business partners. Um, so for example, Exact Earth, uh, which provides an AIS, that's a, a ship positioning uh, data feed. Um, we also have data feeds for uh, companies like Valarum, which provide IoT kind of plug and play solutions uh, for folks that wanted to get into the, the sensor field, um, as well as some other uh, dedicated data feeds. However, we also provide uh, the option, the capabilities for users to create their own inputs uh, through either the GeoEvent Manager, where they can take our existing set of adapters and data transports and make new combinations. Uh, so for example, um, if we wanted to receive text over a REST endpoint, uh, you could create that connector just using the out-of-the-box tools. However, if you want even more customization, uh, we do provide um, a Java-based SDK, which is installed alongside the product. Uh, so if you have Java developers on your teams, uh, they can take some of our existing sample codes and be able to you know, kind of build their own connectors beyond that. On the output side, we have a similar set of options. So RJ mentioned that we can add or update uh, an existing feature uh, within uh, an ArcGIS uh, mapper feature service. Uh, we can also do add or updates to a spatial temporal big data store. The difference between the add and the update is that when you do the add, it's appending a new record. So if you're wanting to do historical analysis on uh, some sort of sensor or some sort of vehicle, every time there's a new observation uh, for that sensor, we create a new record. So you can go back and replay and see the history of that. Or with an update, we're replacing that record based on a unique track ID. So something that's unique about that vehicle, maybe it's a, a VIN number on a, on a vehicle or something like that, or a device ID uh, for a sensor. Every time there's a new observation, we would replace that data in the feature service. Uh, you can also send features out to a stream service. Um, this is a very lightweight um, form of visualization. It does not store any data. Um, but it's all um, preserved client-side in someone's mobile device or web browser, um, but it's a very seamless, very lightweight visualization style. Um, you can also push data back to an external website. So um, one example that we're going to be showcasing here this week uh, is where some of our business partners are bringing in data from Waze, so a very popular uh, data um, provider for uh, you know, traffic information. They have the mobile application. Uh, we have a business partner here called CityWorks. They're actually taking data from Waze, bringing that into the GeoEvent server, and looking for certain patterns. Uh, so two patterns they're looking for um, are particularly things like uh, potholes on the roads or missing highway signs. And they're actually then taking those patterns when they're detected and sending that back out as a service request through CityWorks. So they're able to, you know, have all the people, basically all the drivers driving around in an individual city are now working like knowledge workers to detect problems with their infrastructure. So all of that can be done out of the box. Um, if you're wanting to send notifications, like RJ mentioned, like texts or email messages, you can do that as well. But we also have um, add-on components through the gallery, again, so if you're wanting to send something out to Amazon or Azure, if you're wanting to work with uh, in the IoT space, you can do that. Um, as also, we provide connections to some existing big data infrastructure, such as Hadoop, uh, or if you want to send something out through Kafka as well. Um, we also provide some social media connect connections as well. So we have several customers that are 
you know, ingesting data, looking for certain patterns, and then they're sending a tweet out um, to all their kind of public constituents to let them know of maybe a road closure that's going to be coming soon or some kind of a uh, big event within the city they want to be notified. All of that can be handled automatically uh, through the GeoEvent server. So you don't want to have someone sitting there, you know, tweeting it on their phone. It's, it's just automatically sends. And just like for the inputs, you can create your own custom outputs both through the GeoEvent Manager or through the Java-based SDK as well. So part of the real value of the GeoEvent server is not just that we can ingest data and that we can send data out again, um, but that we're able to enrich that data while it's on the fly, doing that, that kind of on the fly analysis. Um, so we can do things like attribute and spatial filtering. RJ showed that with the example of the, the orange and the blue data types were going through, but the rest were sent out. Um, this can be done by attributes or by spatial. Uh, so for example, you could be looking for a vehicle that was speeding, but I'm only concerned if they're speeding within a residential area. Uh, or I'm concerned, if I'm looking at a temperature sensor. I'm not concerned if that temperature shows 100 degrees and it's on my loading dock but I'm really concerned if that's in my server room and it's 100 degrees. So you can control these combinations together. We also have several processors that are um, dedicated to uh, enhancing the geometry coming in. Um, so things like the buffer creator where you might have a point or a polygon and you want to create a buffer of a given unit beyond that. Um, but we also have some more advanced processors um, such as the difference uh, creator where you could have a, a given service area that you're concerned with and every time you have someone perform an inspection through that area, it actually removes functions, uh, removes parts of that polygon. So at the end of the day, you could see which areas didn't get inspected just based on the combination of uh, the location of your field workers and your defined service areas. Uh, we also have things where you can change the, uh, the projection of the data on the fly. Um, you can do field calculations, so if you have data coming in in one unit and you want to convert it, uh, you can do that very simply. And just like with our, ad, our inputs and outputs, uh, we do have several different kind of add-on capabilities for this as well. Now, um, I will say, I will uh, differentiate these. Some of these are, are sample components. Uh, we have, um, a lot of these are available out on GitHub. Uh, so where folks have built things for, uh, you know, uh, customers have built something or um, some of our professional services project teams may have built something for a specific customer. Uh, and once they were completed, they, they put them out and made them available to the public. Uh, one on there I wanted to highlight that's a really powerful one is called the motion calculator. Uh, so particularly when you're monitoring vehicles traffic, uh, you know, it, it's great to think that the data coming in would have all the information like the speed and the heading and um, all these other sensor things, but sometimes all you have is just geometry and a timestamp. But that's really all you need because if I know where you are at one point and then I know where you are at the next observation, I can calculate how long it took to get from point A to point B. I know the direction you went. Um, if you have some Z value, if you have some sort of elevation, I can detect if there was a slope. So this allows you to take relatively simple input data but actually output a, a much more valuable um, type of data set that you can visualize, you can put it within a web map and you can you know, symbolize it and get a, a much better idea of the data as it's actually coming through. And like before, this can be enriched um, to create custom processors either through the manager or through our Java-based SDK as well. So I know you guys are probably getting tired of slides, so I'm gonna switch it back over to RJ now and let RJ kinda show you a demo of what this looks like. Thanks, Josh. I'm going to continue with our theme of technical difficulties this morning. I have this demo available down in the real-time island if you'd like to interact with it, but for this session I'm going to have to show you a video. What we're looking at here on the screen is the web application GeoEvent Manager. And you see that I've configured a couple of inputs, a couple four outputs, and a couple of GeoEvent services. If we take a look at those inputs, you'll see that I have an AOI receiver and an AVL receiver. The AOI receiver is going to receive JSON on a REST endpoint, and the AVL receiver is using the TCP text-based input that hooks up nicely with a GeoEvent simulator that comes bundled with your pro program's install. 
On the output side, I have a couple of stream services. I mentioned earlier that you don't have to persist features to a database. You can stream them out live to clients. I also have a couple of outputs that are doing feature update in order to paint alerting icons onto my web map. Couple of GeoVent services. The first one is my AOI receiver. That's a simpler service. All it's doing is receiving the JSON, mapping the schema out using a processor, and then passing that event data to a output that is broadcasting it using the stream service. My other service is an AVL receiver. It's a little more interesting, and I'm going to dig into some of the components of that as soon as we complete with this demo. But for this demo, what I'm doing is an automated vehicle location, an AVL. So I'm going to be connecting up to a set of sensor feeds. Maybe I'm receiving the data periodically from a service, such as Verizon's network fleet. And I'm going to be receiving these points, and my one service that is streaming the AVL locations is now putting these locations out onto the web map as a stream layer, and that's what you're seeing now with the vehicle icons and the historical breadcrumbs painting on the screen. These are not feature records, and you see that I have a very smooth experience as the data is displayed up on the screen. Looking over here on the right, I'm going to see an alert pop up. I'm using a filter to determine that the vehicle's reported speed is greater than the allowed speed for the area that he's driving in. And those feature records now are coming from a feature layer and a feature service and are updating every six seconds as the map refreshes. So there's pros and cons as to whether you want to use different types of output. Regardless of which type of output you're using, you can still click on the map to get pop-ups and additional attribute information on the event records that are being broadcast. Now, if I wanted to use a plugin that you can't see here on the screen, but I have downloaded a plugin to my Chrome browser that is going to accept JSON, generic JSON, as posting an area of interest because I might want to be hooking up to, I don't know, a police alert or a dynamic piece of weather that is threatening an area. And I want to establish that as a geofence so that then I can compare the real-time data that I'm receiving from my vehicles or any other feed, and I want to compare that geometry to the geofence that was just displayed here on the screen. So what I'm showing is that I'm not only sending data in using the GeoEvent simulator over a TCP socket, I can actually HTTP post to a REST endpoint to receive data as well. And now as that one vehicle down on the lower right begins to enter that area of interest, we receive a different kind of alert that is telling us he's entering an area that maybe he doesn't need to be in right now because of a road closure or, as I say, maybe there's a police action going on and we want to make sure that our drivers are safe. And we can call up the pop-up there to see that I have an alert code that I've assigned to that particular alert, and that's how I'm able to differentiate and do that unique symbology using the feature layer. And with that, I think I'll turn control back over to Josh. Great. Thanks, RJ. So, RJ, if you would, I'm going to let you actually talk through um, a little bit about how that service was configured. Oh, certainly. So we highlighted this service briefly earlier as I was looking at the video, and what I'd like to do is break the service down into a couple of different pieces. This first piece is taking the data straight through and sending it to the AVL stream, and that was the cars that you saw and the breadcrumbs that were displaying via the stream layer. Another piece, that particular filter is in dangerous area. So in dangerous area is taking a look at whether the vehicle's location is... Nope, that's speeding. I'm sorry, that's speeding. So it, that filter is taking a look at whether the vehicle's speed is greater than another attribute in that same event record. So I can say A greater than B, I need to post an alert out to say this vehicle is speeding. And you'll see there that I'm using a geotagger to determine the... Um, geotagger? The, yes. 
So I'm using a geotagger to get the name of the geofence that it intersects with. A third portion down there then is the, the well, I guess this one it's is going speeding. to be the in dangerous area. That's speeding. Or is that speeding? Okay, so anyway. Sorry, I'm, it makes it really small on the screen, so it's hard to. I have, to, <laughs> I have two different filters. One is looking at attributes, and one is looking at the geometry. And then depending on which filtering I'm doing, I'm either enriching the event using a geotagger processor, or in both cases, I'm using a field mapper to prepare the schema for whatever the output wants to see. So I'm selecting fields of interest in order to pass through to the output. You design your GeoEvent service in that GeoEvent Manager web application that you saw when you popped up first. It's a very visual programming type style. And you should think of GeoEvent services as small little programs. You're not writing any code, but you are designing these real-time analytics because every one of these filters and processors are configurable to do work that you want to do. And again, we'll be digging a little deeper into real-time analytics in a more immediate session later this afternoon. Great, thanks, RJ. Um, so a couple things that are really important to be able to take away from this is, from what we've seen so far, um, you're being able to do the ingestion, you're being able to perform different analysis. RJ showed some examples in the service there of you know, how you can configure to look for different types of patterns. Um, but then the question is, you know, what do I do with it? How do I consume this? How do I share this information out uh, when, I'm when I'm done with it? Um, so the first option, and which is sometimes the easiest and what RJ was showing, um, is being able to go through a stream service. So a stream service is a really powerful, lightweight way of, of visualizing the data. Um, it pushes it directly from the geo event server out to a client that subscribes to that data. Uh, and those clients can be any of our uh, JavaScript-based web apps on Portal uh, or ArcGIS Online. Uh, also, with the 2.2 release of ArcGIS Pro, uh, you can now bring uh, stream layers directly into Pro. You can actually perform uh, even better visualization and, and some really cool uh, symbology changes that can be built into that. Uh, you can then you know, view it there in Pro, or you can publish it back up as kind of an enhanced um, web map. Uh, but some of the downsides of that is, you know, there's no storage. So that's great. I don't need to set up a storage solution. But the problem is all the data you're receiving is all just stored in that client's browser session. So if I've been watching um, an animal, I've been, you know, monitoring its patterns of movements over the last several hours, and I go to refresh my browser, I don't see any of the old observations. All I'm going to see is new observations that are getting loaded into the browser's cache. So if you need to be able to do some sort of playback to be able to look at the historical observations, it's going to require that you write the data out to a feature service, either through uh, a relational feature service uh, that's backed by you know, Oracle or SQL Server or the ArcGIS data store, which is based on PostgreSQL. Uh, and in that case, those client applications would have to pull the ArcGIS Enterprise uh, and they'll be able to get you know, a response and be able to kind of see uh, where those observations are. It's a similar process if you want to pull data that's been written out to the spatiotemporal big data store. Uh, the benefit of that big data store is, uh, particularly if you are bringing in any kind of high volume or high velocity data, it provides uh, multiple different types of visualization options, enhancements beyond just a regular feature service uh, that help differentiate uh, when you start to get into the thousands or tens of thousands or, or millions of observations within a given area. It also allows you to work with some of our other big data analysis tools uh, that are part of the ArcGIS Enterprise. So for example, one would be the GeoAnalytics server, uh, which allows you to uh, read directly into the spatial temporal big data store and do really large scale batch analysis on that data. So to kind of functionally summarize what the GeoEvent server can do, there's really, it really kind of boils down to five key capabilities that we want to make sure you take away. So the first is ingestion, being able to bring in data from multiple different types of data sources, uh, be able to match up their different schemas, different what we call GeoEvent definitions, so different data structures, Regardless of what the source is, we want to bring them into a single common operating picture that we can work against. 
We provide real-time analytics on that data while it's in transit. So, you know, unlike maybe more traditional GIS types of analysis where you'd go back and look at a week or a day's worth of data and then try to look through certain patterns, with the Geo Event Server, you're able to define what you want to look for ahead of time, and as the data's coming through, it's being compared against those rules that you've defined. We provide a big data storage solution. This is essential if you're going to be doing any kind of archiving um, of any kind of high velocity data. Um, because it provides you not just the option of a location to store it, um, but it provides some enhanced options for data retention. So if you want to control how long I want to keep the data for, if there's certain type of data you want to keep but others you're willing to purge, all of that control is available through our spatial temporal big data store. We provide enhanced visualization options beyond what's available directly through the ArcGIS Enterprise, both for live features through the stream services and if you're wanting to work with live and historic features, you can display those as, eager, as either aggregated bins for some of the higher um, volume data or as discrete features. And the final capability is we provide actuation um, back to either devices in the field. We can provide notification um, as well as output to other kind of uh, you know, third party data feeds uh, that can support a RESTful interface. So we have several different sessions uh, that are coming up this week uh, dedicated to uh, working with real time in big data GIS. Um, you're going to see these slides in every one of our sessions, but since this is the introduction, I want to take a few minutes to talk through some of these sessions. So depending on um, your experience, depending on your interests in working with real time data, uh, some sessions that I wanted to call out to your attention. Um, so what you're in now, of course, is the introduction session. Uh, this will be repeated again this afternoon at 4 p.m. Hopefully we'll have both projectors working at that point uh, for you. Um, we have a session immediately following this uh, right next door, uh, which is kind of taking a, a step away from just uh, working within the ArcGIS Enterprise and looking at, at how we work with the, the larger Internet of Things. So for those of you that are looking at smart cities and smart communities, that's a great session that's going to be presented uh, following this one. Uh, we have a session this afternoon that RJ mentioned, uh, which is dedicated to applying real-time analytics. So if your interest is, you know, what types of uh, processors can I apply? How can I look for this sort of pattern? What types of things can I detect? We have a great session on that this afternoon that's going to take a deep dive into that. Uh, we have sessions tomorrow that focus specifically on the spatial temporal big data store. So if you're at the point where you're bringing in a lot of data already and you're trying to figure out what's the next steps, what can I do, um, there's a wonderful session tomorrow that will focus on that aspect. Uh, the Road Ahead session, this is always one of my favorites because it really kind of shows where the technology is going. Uh, it shows some of the new capabilities we're going to be adding over the next year. Um, both on-premise as well as through um, ArcGIS Online. Uh, we have a session coming up later in the week uh, which is focused on best practices. This is a, a more advanced session. Uh, so if today was your first introduction to GeoEvent Server, uh, I will admit this session might be a little more complex. Uh, this is geared towards our existing customers and gets into the weeds on some uh, tuning that can be done to improve performance and different tweaks that can be done in the settings to kind of get the most performance um, out of the product as well. Um, we have a new session this year that we're excited. Um, this is the one dedicated here called the, the Smart Workplace, uh, which is monitoring assets and personnel in real time. Uh, this is actually a, a co-presentation uh, between our team, the real time and big data GIS team, uh, and the new uh, ArcGIS Indoors team. So it's showing, you know, how do I do some of this types of analysis when I'm looking at uh, indoor tracking as opposed to you know external GPS. You know what are the challenges that are uh, that come into play when you're trying to work inside an enclosed space. Uh, and then we have one final session Thursday afternoon, uh, which is just focused on stream services. Some of the um, the key capabilities that can be shown. Uh, how can I use that in a custom client? How can I use that in a web app? How can I see that in Pro? Uh, it just gives you a little deeper uh, look into that. Uh, a few things of housekeeping I wanted to kind of share with before we open it up for questions here. Um, we do have a survey that's available for those of you that are using the, uh, the Esri Events app on your phone. Uh, this survey is, is really geared to help us um, know which sessions we should be presenting. Um, you can complain about technical glitches today, I, and I, I certainly expect to see some, that's fine. 
Um, but it kind of helps us, you know, know what material we want to cover. Uh, we have a, our team has a, a pretty huge presence this year. We have 14 sessions we're presenting, um, and it really helps us know, you know, which ones are the most important to you. Um, but even beyond this survey, um, I want to call out a new survey that was built this year. Um, this is something that was built specifically for our product, um, and it, it's really geared towards those customers that are already using some of our real-time and big data capabilities. Um, this, is, this is some feedback that's going directly to myself as the product manager and the developers on our team to help us kind of shape uh, the product. So if there's aspects of the software that you're using and saying, you know, I really like this, but I'm having problems on this, or I really wish the product would do this, this is your direct feedback uh, to myself and our development team to say, this is what works well, this is what I need help with. Um, and it's also a way for us to, to hopefully capture more information about what you're doing with the product. If there's certain use cases um, that you're working in, you'd like to share them. We'd love to work with you to help build some case studies, share those workflows with other users, um, and help you know, further develop our community of kind of real-time and big data GIS users. And I think you have a box of cards with that URL. I do. I have some cards. So for those of you that don't have a phone and aren't taking pictures, um, I do have some cards up here that have the same, same screen. So if you didn't take a picture, but you want to grab this, you don't have to furiously write it down. Grab the card, and you can you know, uh, enter it later when you get a chance to do that as well. So with that, I'm going to open it up to you guys, um, see what questions you have about the product, and you go from there. Yes, right in the front. So the question was, uh, this customer has CityWorks on their system already. They have some AVL data that they're working with, um, but you'd like to add some additional information. You'd like to be able to bring in some data feeds. Um, another GeoEvent server. Yes. So can you put multiple, can you run multiple GeoEvent services on that? Yes. So if you wanted to bring in something like Waze, Waze is a, um, they, they have a, uh, a free, data feed for municipal partners. So cities, um, uh, they're able to subscribe to what's called the uh, Connected Citizens Program. And there's actually some folks from Waze here this week um, that are gonna, you know, I could certainly put you in contact with as well. Um, but you can bring that data in. Um, we can set up the same kind of a sit sitting for you. Uh, I actually think the city of Raleigh, North Carolina, um, is gonna be at the Waze booth for part of this week. Uh, so it'll be great to talk to them and they can sh tell you exactly how they set it up and, and share that with you, so. Other questions? Yes? I know that when you look at the data, it was an API user. Is that a custom developed receiver for a particular system or is that a generic receiver that we can use? How do I know that I can plug in to our API system? So the question was dealing with the AVL receiver input that I had configured. That was not a custom solution. That was a configurable input, and all I do is configure the input with the data that it wants to receive, so I'm not writing any code. GeoEvent hosts the endpoint, and then I provide that endpoint to whatever the data provider is so that they can send me the data via HTTP post. Now that being said, I will say there are some AVL providers, and, and regardless of whether or not it's vehicle or any other sensor, that do have proprietary formats. We're able to receive data that comes in JSON, XML, GeoJSON, or delimited text. But if they're sending data in a binary format, something that's proprietary for their devices, you'll need to either check against our gallery to see if we already have an existing connection for them, or um, we may have to work with you to try and build something custom. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, the question is, is the same for smart meters? Absolutely. Any kind of data feed, if they're sending it over in a standard format, which is one of those, those formats I just mentioned, then we should be able to receive it and process it out of the box. But if they're sending it in a binary format, um, then we may have to do some work to receive it. Um, when I'm speaking with people that are new to GeoEvent, that are interested in integrating GeoEvent for the first time, I usually say we should start with two questions. How is the data arriving? What is its transport? Is it coming in over TCP socket? Is it coming in over WebSocket? 
Is it coming in over HTTP REST? Once we answer that first question, the second question is what format is the data in? As Josh said, JSON, GeoJSON, delimited text, XML, these are all very generic formats for data and GeoEvent understands all of these formats. You don't have to develop a custom connector for any of it. You just select which type of data is being received and then send it over the defined transport. So we have another question right here? Yes. So the installation experience, GeoEvent Server is a component of your ArcGIS Enterprise. So you start with ArcGIS Enterprise and you install ArcGIS Server as the component of the enterprise that is behind GeoEvent and then we get into licensing. So are you licensing a single machine and you want to license ArcGIS Server Advanced and then add GeoEvent to that? Or are you setting up a second machine that is extending your enterprise, so to speak, with real-time capability, in which case you install ArcGIS Server a second time, but you don't license it a second time. You license it only with GeoEvent, and then you run the setup exe that is GeoEvent to add GeoEvent onto that second box. And this allows you to expand the functions of the ArcGIS Enterprise that you need. So if you don't have a need to share out a lot of maps and feature services uh, from your organization, but you do have a large need to ingest a lot of data, you can scale out just the component, just the installations of GeoEvent Server as that functional role. You can install that on multiple servers as well and run those as either siloed sites so you can have multiple instances of GeoEvent Server each functioning independently of each other, or if you needed uh, greater scalability um, on that data feed, you can have them work together as a single site uh, and they'll kind of distribute the processing across multiple machines for that. Other questions? We'll go here and then we'll get to you afterwards. Okay. We're on the wall. Huh? The third question oh, we're on sorry? the wall. Okay, thank you. <laughs> go ahead. All right. Uh, have you ever encountered uh, the pin date stage uh, with reading sequences from ABL data? Can you repeat the first part of the question? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. The fin weight state. Have you encountered fin, that? Fin weight? Yeah. Fin I'm, weight. I'm not familiar with that. Because uh, um, I was reading a, a feature service uh, to Oracle database, and on the server side, uh, the, the fin weight state of the GeoEvent server was creating the, um, the services, uh, too many services, and it was loading. I had to shut down everything. Hmm. We may want to talk to you about that at the real-time island, and we may also need to loop in technical support while we're here at the conference. That sounds like a specific technical issue. But to a, a geo event, what we're doing is we're polling the endpoint that is the feature service and bringing back over the JSON. So it's not so much a state of the features as to whether the service is available to receive the request. I tried to troubleshoot with every support. Let's come down to the showcase. We can definitely get you some help. Okay, in the in the back here, and then we'll go to the wall. <laughs> So the question is, can you configure the email outputs to send calendar invites? I have never tried. Uh, I, I you could certainly set it up to send out. Um, in HTML format. I don't know what type of encoding is required for like an Outlook invite. Um, it'd be a really interesting use case to try to see what would be involved in that. Something we can certainly work with you offline about. I'd love for you to grab one of my cards and we can kind of follow up after the conference um, and see what would be, if, if it's something that is, is, is just a matter of HTML formatting to get it into that kind of invite or if there's if it requires some sort of plug-in, then we'd have to kind of see what's available for that. But great question. I'd love to know. So I've never tried before. So, and on the wall. All right. Uh, you had mentioned that uh, there's you know, two different outputs essentially that you can gather from your data. So there's the screening service, which is pulling that information. Um, and then there's the browser that's pulling that information. And then you also have the storage service. Is there, with one service or with one input, is there a way of taking that from the whole? So like, say for example, I want to show something out on the website for our system is a secret. We don't want to use data internally that has a little bit more, you know, 
Absolutely. So a pattern that you might, to repeat the question, if I have a, an event stream, can I route the data from one input to multiple outputs? And the answer is absolutely yes. I might have a need to archive data, not at the same rate that it's coming in. Maybe I only want to persist feature records every three minutes or every five minutes. But I want a steady stream every 10 seconds that I receive the data so I can get a real-time display up on the web map of where the vehicles are right now. But for auditing or just vehicle tracking purposes, I only want to persist the vehicle's location every five minutes. I can send that out to two different outputs. And then because I am, so to speak, forking the data into two different event paths, I can apply filtering and mapping on each of those so that I can simplify the data for the common operational picture, but keep a more rich event structure for the archival that's going on every several minutes. And that could involve things like removing sensitive data from the public feed. You may not want to show the name of the officer, or you may not even want to show a current position uh, or some vehicles. So I know that's a common uh, story for a lot of cities where they're fine with showing where their utility vehicles are, but they don't want to show where their police cruisers are for something along those lines. So separate. The questions here in the back. So the question was, could you populate uh, automatic form data coming out of GeoVent Server? Yes, you can. Uh, so that's actually the use case we mentioned before with, uh, for CityWorks. Uh, with CityWorks, for example, that's not, we don't have, at least at this point, a dedicated output connector for CityWorks or whatever other provider you might be working with, or even our own applications. What we send out is what's called a, um, a message formatter. So similar to like what Arjo is mentioning, you could put in HTML formatting when you're sending an email. You can actually have it format a post request or a get request with your form structure. Um, and you just put uh, basically field names into that message. And as the data comes through, it replaces those with the field values and pushes it out. Um, it's a little, I'd say out of the box, it's maybe a little more work to get set up than some of the just default, just because of the sheer variety of types of formatting you can get into. Um, if it's something you're interested in, uh, I'd say come down to the booth and we can show you how to get it set up or follow up with me offline and I can kind of show you how to get those set up directly. There's also the option of just using a feature service to integrate that data. So I can have a feature schema that maybe has 25 or 30 fields, including things like crew name, crew ID number, things that a customer doesn't necessarily have but I'm going to take a shorter schema or a shorter set of the attributes using my field mapper to select the inbound data, write that out to a partial feature record that then that it shows up as an alert on your web map, your operator clicks on it and starts assigning crews and fills in the additional information. So that's another out of the box way of integrating with forms that doesn't require doing HTML coding to push the data directly into a third party app. I know there's another question a few rows in front. No nope. one down we'll here. Come back. Let me get this one here first. Was there another one there? Uh, yeah, I think. So the question was, can you clarify uh, the relationships between the inputs, the outputs, and the services within the service. Um, so basically what you're building in the middle of, of GeoEvent is this component called a GeoEvent service. Uh, this is basically the same function as Model Builder in any of our desktop applications where you're bringing in, you're kind of a drag and drop, this is the input, I'm dragging and dropping in the output that I want, which I've configured separately. I've pre-configured an input, I've pre-configured an output, you drag them together, Whatever processors you want to use, whatever kind of geoprocessing you want to do, you'll pull that into the model and you're, and you're connecting the input to whatever processors you want and then to the output. All of that information is stored in this GeoEvent service that can be turned on or off. But you've pre-configured your inputs and your outputs already. So you would have already set up your different outputs. Uh, and typically in those cases, the output is pointing to, it's, it's pointing to something else. So 
if I'm going to write to a feature service, I have an output that has all of the parameters that lets me know where that feature service is. If I need, if there's, you know, whatever security needs to be passed, all of that's set up behind the scenes, um, but it's going to push to something else. So that actual output, you're not necessarily consuming, but whatever the output is sending data to is what you're going to receive. So for the examples of the stream services, when you're creating a stream service, it actually publishes a service through uh, ArcGIS Server. You could go to the REST endpoint, the services directory of ArcGIS Server. You can see, oh, there's a new service here called a stream layer, a stream service. You'd put that in the web map. But what GeoEvent Server is doing is pushing data to that stream layer, to that stream service, which is then visualized through the client. So we have a couple of different kinds of processing that we don't want to confuse. The one is the real-time analytics, a simpler set of filtering and processing that you do inside GeoEvent Server versus geoprocessing, that set of seven to 1,200 tools that you get with ArcGIS Desktop. So we're not invoking any of those tools to do geoprocessing. We're doing real-time streaming analytics as the data arrives. And maybe that is to select a set of data that I'm only interested in events that are within the bounds of Central Park. And I'm going to persist that out as features so that every 30 minutes I can run a batch task on desktop using a more powerful geoprocessing tool on the data that is accumulated over the last 30 minutes. Any question down here? Oh, yeah. I work for a battle one call center, so we've got tons of data that's coming in. And I don't necessarily want to throw away some of that data just in case we may need it. And I saw one of your slides that said there's a NoSQL database storage type option. Is that something that by default comes with it, or do I have to go out and get a Mongo or something? That so the question is to do with the spatial temporal big data store. That is a capability of ArcGIS data store, which is licensed along with your ArcGIS enterprise. So you can install portal, you install server, then you install as many instances of ArcGIS data store as you want to build up this NoSQL data ring. We're actually using Elasticsearch under the hood. And then to you, it just looks like an enterprise database. You add and update feature records the same as you would do with SQL Server. The difference is we can store data at a higher velocity and a higher volume in the NoSQL database than we can in, say, SQL Server or Oracle. So the choice is yours as to what type of enterprise database you want, but it is a part of ArcGIS data store. It is not a bring-your-own-Mongo solution. We do, however, also have add-on components that if you are coming with your own Mongo solution, you could choose to write to that as an output as well. But we try to, you know, whenever possible, provide you all of the capabilities you need through install, in, you know, installable components. So in this case, the, our primary NoSQL database is what's installed as a part or optionally installed as a part of the ArcGIS data store. Um, but it is a common solution for um, maybe some of the larger installations that already have existing deployments of Mongo, or maybe they are already using Kafka or, or ActiveMQ or something like that in their organization. They want to use uh, the, the geospatial capabilities of the GeoEvent server to power some enrichment before sending it into their existing deployments. But you know you shouldn't have to deploy that unless you are unless you have an external business need for those other systems. Another question? So do you have an output connector that can write an update to a SQL database or not? So the question is, do we have an output connector that will write directly to a SQL database? Well, yeah. At this point, we do not have anything that writes directly to SQL. The way that we would work um, with anything coming out of SQL or Oracle uh, is that it would need to be exposed through a feature service. Yeah. And we would write over REST to the feature service. Um, so if you needed to update a table or you know, a, you know, a, a feature class that you'd published, you would publish that as a feature service. Um, and then we would communicate directly through that service. Um, I know there has been some project work um, by some of our professional services teams to work with customers directly writing to a, a SQL. Uh, I'm not sure the state of those projects. Yeah, sure, sure.
It's, it's, I don't know, it's one of those things where I think there's, um, it brings in other levels of complexity, some of the requirements and the ODBC, some of the way the connections work on that side. If it's something you have a business need for, uh, I'd ask that you know, kind of follow up with us and we can kind of talk offline to see um, if it's, you know, if there's a big enough need for it that we, it, that it's worth pursuing, then we can certainly try to, you know, maybe next year we'll have one, I don't know, you know. Yeah. As a design principle, though, we're trying to keep GeoEvent Server database agnostic. So we're not developing connectors directly for Postgres or directly for Oracle or directly for SQL Server. We want to use the enterprise database at a higher level, and that's why we're going through the feature service. Any other question? One more hand. Yeah. So the question was, if you have a feature, if you're if you're using Survey One Two Three and you have a hosted feature layer on from that data or running on ArcGIS Online, can you connect to that and bring that into GeoVent Server, or does it have to be on the local ArcGIS Enterprise? Is what you're asking. Yes, we can connect directly to. Um, feature layers that are on ArcGIS Online as well as those running off the local enterprise. So if you are writing to a hosted feature layer on ArcGIS Online, uh, we can also connect and, and, and read and write from that service, to that layer. How does that, I, mean, I, I see that the portal in ArcGIS mm -hmm. Online for reading it to GIS. So what we have is, in the question is, you know, it's a little bit different, you know, how's the configuration different? Yes. Uh, so within GeoEvent Server, uh, you have the option of configuring multiple different types of data store connections. We have a separate data store connection that's uh, specific for ArcGIS Online. Our, our is going to pull it up here and, and show you what that looks like, uh, so you can kind of see how that works. Uh, once, we've, once we've discovered that service, it works with all of our tools that work with, you know, reading or writing the feature service. Um, I think there's something with that. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to go down to the network. Um, but come down to the booth and we can show you how to set that up, specifically ArcGIS Online. Uh, it's just another option when you're setting up the connection where you put in your credentials to server or portal. There's a third option for ArcGIS Online where you just set that up, so. Final question, any last one? One last one, okay. And then come on, anyone else have questions, please come up, talk to us. We're gonna be here for a few minutes, so, you know. <laughs>